Today, Major General Smedley Butler had these words to say at the National VFW. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. There are only two things we should fight for. One is the defense of our homes and the other is the Bill of Rights. War for any other reason is simply a racket. It may seem odd for me, a military man, to adopt such a comparison. Truthfulness compels me to. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service as a member of this country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general. And during that period, I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. I suspected I was just part of a racket at the time. Now I am sure of it. I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National Citibank boys. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefits of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1910. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. In China, I helped to see to it that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. <laughs> Looking back on it, I feel I could have given Al Capone a few tips. The best he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small, inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. In the World War, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets? Out of war, nations acquire additional territory if they are victorious. They just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the selfsame few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. It would have been far cheaper and safer for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits but the cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. Take the World War. It cost the United States taxpayer some $52 billion, and we haven't paid that debt yet. But ultimately, it's the soldier who pays the biggest part of the bill. If you don't believe this, visit the American cemeteries on the battlefields abroad, or visit any of the veterans' hospitals in the United States. Napoleon once said, all men are enamored of decorations, they positively hunger for them. So, by developing the Napoleonic system, the metal business, the government learned it could get soldiers for less money, because the boys liked to be decorated. Until the Civil War, there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out. It made enlistments easier. In the World War, we used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. So vicious was this war propaganda that even God was brought into it. With few exceptions, our clergymen joined in the clamor to kill, kill, kill. To kill the Germans, God is on our side. It is his will that the Germans be killed. And in Germany, the good pastors called upon the Germans to kill the allies, to please the same God. Beautiful ideals were painted for our boys who were sent out to die. This was the war to end all wars. This was the war to make the world safe for democracy. No one mentioned to them as they marched away that their going and their dying would mean huge war profits. 
Thus, having stuffed patriotism down their throats, it was decided to help make them pay for the war too. So we gave them the large salary of $30 a month. All they had to do for this munificent sum was to leave their dear ones behind, give up their jobs, lie in swampy trenches, and kill, and kill, and kill! And be killed. Well, war is a racket, all right. And the only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital, industry, and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted. Let all the officers, directors, high-powered executives, all the workers, managers, bankers, and yes, all the generals, admirals, officers, and all politicians, all government office holders, everyone in the nation, be restricted to a total monthly income not to exceed that paid to the soldier. Why shouldn't they? They aren't running any risk of being killed or having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. The soldiers are! Give capital, industry, and labor 30 days to think it over, and I think you will find by that time there will be no war. Another step necessary in the fight to smash the war racket is the limited plebiscite to determine whether a war should be declared. A plebiscite not of all the voters, but merely of those who would be called upon to do the fighting and dying. There wouldn't be very much sense in having the president of a munitions factory or the head of an international banking firm or the manager of a uniform manufacturing plant all of whom see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war, voting on whether the nation should go to war or not. They never would be called upon to shoulder arms. Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. That would smash the war racket, that and nothing else. The next war, according to experts, will be fought not with battleships, not by artillery, not with rifles, and not with machine guns. It will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases. But victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists. If we put them to work making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive instruments of destruction, they will have no time for the constructive job of building a greater prosperity for all peoples. By putting them to this useful job, we can all make more money out of peace than we can out of war. So, I say, to hell with war! <laughs>